Live. Welcome back to the DL Link Show. I have Dr. Lawrence Gobitz on the line. He is a specialist when it comes to reproductive medicine, as well as a fellow of the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We're talking about um, the fact that uh, the month of June is World Infertility Awareness Month, that the numbers are going up in terms of um, uh, couples being infertile, well, finding difficulty really in, in falling pregnant. Um, and Dr. Gobitz, you were saying a lot of it has to do with the fact that couples are trying to fall pregnant a lot later in life. So we were talking about freezing these eggs um, and that you were obviously suggesting the earlier, the younger you are, the better it is. Uh, you've got better eggs to work with um, and the better the, the outcome will be. Before we do move towards me, just one thing, with all of your experience, are you finding that there is a turn of the tide, so to speak, in that young women are starting to be proactive and say, you know what, I'm going to freeze my eggs. Are you, I mean, we've discussed it but are you are you seeing that trend Nikki the only trend we're seeing is that you have your single 38 year olds and single 39 year olds who've realized that they're reaching the end of their reproductive career and they've now woken up to say you know what a few eggs in the freezer are going to be better than no eggs in the freezer mm -hmm. and obviously we counsel them appropriately so the move currently is more the reproductively older female now we know today our 40 year olds are like our 20 year olds 30 years ago you know and when they look at themselves they say but how can my eggs be old and what do you mean by that so at the end of the day that's the group coming forward but what i'm trying to get across is that we need to get to the under 30s who yeah. haven't yet settled in with their lives, who haven't yet got Mr. Right um, or the correct partner, whatever that may be. And at the end of the day, that's who should be putting the eggs in the freezer. And um, the, 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 the patient of that age group, unfortunately, is those patients with a cancer diagnosis where we do fertility preservation related to the diagnosis of cancer, be it in the male or in the female. So we're finding that the young eggs in the freezer are, are, are cancer patients and fortunately the oncologists now are quite aware of it because we are part of an international oncology consortium so the oncologists in the past um, would just take the patient and immediately put them on chemotherapy not thinking in terms of well maybe this young woman wants to have a family so they refer them directly to us we see them immediately we stimulate them put the eggs in the freezer and then they go and uh, have their chemo or radio or whatever it is or surgery so that's the young group presenting to us. The older group presenting to us often come in too late. Yeah. So, so age. So you've 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 described so well. I mean, what happens to the eggs, and we have limited amount of eggs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there a way, though, um, that we could look after our eggs? So, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of um, the way we eat, stress levels, could that have an impact on the quality of eggs and the longevity of our eggs, or are they not related? No, they don't seem to be related. And 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 the I think a woman has got two ages. She has a chronological age, which in this country is easy. You just look at the ID number and we can tell you how old you are. But you have a genetic age. In other words, I think it all happens at the time of conception where the female egg age has been predetermined and the rate at which your uh, loss occurs is genetic. And mm -hmm. there are some women who will lose much slower than others. And uh, that is why some women at 40 will still have a very good store. It doesn't mean that those eggs are genetically more normal because they're 40-year-old eggs, but it does mean that we'll have a better chance at achieving a pregnancy for her because it is a numbers game. And the more eggs we can get, the better the chance we'll find a normal embryo. So the younger you are, the more genetically competent the eggs are, the less eggs you need in the freezer to give yourself your two children. The older you are, the more eggs you require. So the thing of, of your, your, your genetic age, as I say, is a difficult one to predict on the one hand, although today gynecologists are becoming more aware of it. And what you can do is we do what is called an enteral follicle count. So on vaginal ultrasound, we can look at the ovaries and we can see these little egg structures in the ovaries which are very simple and you can count them and we unfortunately see young girls with low egg counts now that's a girl at 24 that the gyne gynecologist should be referring that patient to a fertility unit 
and then give the patient the advice and let the patient make the decision. There is a hormone that we can measure and the hormone is called AMH, anti-Mullerian hormone, which also correlates well with a female egg age. Um, it does not uh, in any way give us an understanding of what the genetic age is, but it tells us what their store is like. So we do have a biochemical marker, and that's an easy one to do, but we don't want patients just to do the AMH and then go and look on the Lancet app and look at the level, and now they don't know what to do with the level because they've gone and asked for the level. No doctors asked for it, and unfortunately, doctors, doctors are not happy for patients to do their own blood tests and then ask the doctor to interpret the result. Mm -hmm. So I just caution on what I'm saying, not, to, not for anyone now to run to a lab and do the AMH level, which is just purely a blood test. Yeah, no. I mean, obviously, you would have to be, you would have to do that with with a specialist, a specialist in conjunction with your with your gynecologist. But I'm just, as you as you're speaking, I'm just thinking about changing the way um, family planning um, will move forward because family planning maybe has to be something that is proactively done from a young age, as you say. If a, if from one of these scans, they can a gynecologist can see a limited amount of eggs at a young age, that you would be proactive. I mean, it really turns things around. Around, uh, Dr. Goberts, you know, we, we with COVID-19, we're seeing how the world is changing and how we're going to start changing the way we do things. And now with the technology and what we have access to in terms of with scans and, and everything that you've been talking about, if that would actually change if a proactive family planning from a young age. Very interesting to see how that would play out. No, well, that's a, that's a brilliant suggestion. In other words, it, this should play, this should be the role of your average gynecologist who's seeing a young girl for contraceptive advice. And that gynecologist should scan those ovaries and have a look at the antral follicle count. And, sure. uh, and, and why I say is that we, we have our own egg bank here for donor eggs for, for recipient couples where the woman's in her mid forties. Um, we get them pregnant with the young, healthy donor eggs. And, uh, we see a lot of young women today with low egg reserve and we don't know why. And what we don't know is, is this a new thing? Um, or is this perhaps something that we would have seen had I taken my mother and her friends and looked at their egg counts when they got into their uh, late twenties after completing their families by 22? So, you know, is this something that's been with us all along? Is this something that's new? And again, I go back and I didn't answer your question. Is there something that we can do? Although I did say I think it's genetic. Um, you know, it's the same thing. You see patients who smoke 60 cigarettes a day with six children. And they're also mm -hmm. drinking three liters of brandy a day and they've got six children. So, you know, lifestyle, again, I say, I don't believe it's, it's that. I think it's, it's egg age and it's, it's genetics. And we need to play a role as gynecologists to pick out those girls that have a low store, those women, should I say, that have a low egg store at a young age and get them referred to reproductive medicine specialists. Mm, mm. Yeah, I, and I just think it's, it's perhaps a changing mindset, you know, it's like looking at, oh, well, you've got problems with your iron or you've got high cholesterol or you've got, you're just identifying certain areas and you kind of change the way you do things along the way. It really is quite a, a, a radical, I think, amazing approach. But let's move, because we don't have much time left, let's, let's move to men and male issues. What, what are you, what is the most common problem that you're finding in terms of infertility with males? Is misinterpretation of a normal semen analysis by people who don't know how to read semen analyses. Ah. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, you go and do a semen analysis at a pathology laboratory, and because one parameter is low, the computer prints out a report and then the doctor reads a report. And then the computer now has told you that there's a problem with the male. But in fact, there's nothing wrong with that male. And the fact, the problem is his wife's 44. So, you know, so at the end of the day, a lot of males are pronounced subfertile or infertile by a piece of paper which, and there is only one thing, Nikki, that says to me that that male sperm is good and that's a positive pregnancy test in his partner. And there's only one thing that says to me the female ovulated and that is a positive pregnancy test in that woman in the two weeks after the cycle of ovulation. So on paper, we have, how do we know what's normal? So the World Health Organization helped us. They looked at 5,000 couples who conceived within a year where the female was under the age of 38, and they went to every male and got a specimen, and they were able to draw a bell curve. And the 5% of the worst specimens that achieved the pregnancy, those are our normal levels. 
But we know there's a lot of males walking around with subfertile sperm, but the female compensates for the male. It doesn't work around the other way around. In other words, yeah. we don't get Superman compensating for subfertile females. So on the one hand, it's how have you interpreted that semen analysis, number one. Number two, if you satisfy the criteria, and that is where the sperm parameters are at least above that 5% of the bell curve that we use as our normal levels, and there has not been a pregnancy in a year, it's not necessarily the male. I mean, if we know, we know that there are certain counts, very low counts, very, very no motile sperm, um, very poor percentage of normal shapes, um, where we could say, listen, this is playing a role. And we know if we look at it, one third is male, one third is female, and one third is a combination, male and female. So one, one's got to be careful how you interpret it. And often we see males that have been referred to us because there's no sperm. And when we do the proper semen analysis, there's nothing wrong with the guy. In the meantime, the poor lady's got TB of her pelvis and her tubes are blocked. Mm. So, you know, you've got to look at it holistically. You can't mm. just look at one factor and say, oh, here's where your problem lies. Yeah. So just because we're going to say goodbye now, but just based on what we've said, um, look at your age. Look at how long you've been trying to fall pregnant. Um, get the right advice. Go to the right people who are going to be reading the reports correctly. And also for people who are listening, you know, young women who are listening, who have these incredible careers or a, an idea of planning life and not taking family planning into consideration, you know, to really start to consider um, freezing eggs from a young age. I mean, I've never had this discussion before, and, and I think it's a very important discussion to have. So I, I thank you, Dr. Gobitz, for bringing that onto the show today, because I, I think that we've left a lot of uh, uh, room to think, um, you know, for our audience in terms of family planning. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank really, you. It's, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I hope we'll have you on the show again. Thanks, Nikki. Have a lovely day. Thank you, and you too. Dr. Lawrence Gobitz, who is a reproductive medicine specialist and a fellow of the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. How do you feel about that? Isn't that incredible um, that uh, a lot of the time put down to women who are having children, trying to have children later on in life, freezing eggs, and that eggs, freezing eggs is something that can happen from a younger age. There would be more success. And how, what would it look like in terms of infidelity and or having difficulty falling pregnant if women froze their eggs at a younger age. Really a lot to think about. Wow.